All right. Hey, if everybody can find a seat. Nobody. I feel like I'm at home right now in my own family. I talk, but only a few of my really good kids listen. I'm canceling you. Oh, I love this. I always tell people, and don't miss this, what we just did right now is just as much worship of God as everything else that we do. Whenever God's people interact together in and around the person of Jesus, it brings so much, I think, just uh, gladness to the heart of God to see his kids being together and interacting together. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed that time of worship. Um, my name's Todd Nicewanger. I've seen a few uh, new people, and so just wanted to say uh, welcome to Cornerstone. We're glad you're able to be with us. Um, this morning, if you need a Bible and you don't have a Bible, we'd like to provide one for you. And so there'll be some people walking down the, the aisles. If you need one, just raise your hand. Um, we'd be happy to get it to you. And even too, if you keep it, that's totally fine. It's uh, totally our gift to you. We want you to be able to have God's Word in your hands. And so if you do have a Bible, open up to uh, Romans 1. That's where we're going to be today. We've been studying the, the book of Romans. We're just going to be in Romans 1 for just a little bit. Just don't forget, we've been going through an introduction. We've been doing a four-week introduction to the book of Romans. And I promise you, once we start going through the book of Romans, we won't move as slowly. But I did want to make sure just all of us had a good grasp going into the book of Romans to help us kind of understand where, where Paul's going. Now, one of the things that we've really tried to do in looking at the book of Romans, and this is important to kind of understand is it's not that we're gonna be talking about this idea in which everything that we've believed is wrong. That is exactly the opposite of what I'm trying to do as we begin to kind of poke into this. What I think I'm trying to say is that there is just more, I think, to our understanding of what Paul's trying to say than what we've given kind of credence to inside of this particular letter. Not only that, and this is where I think it's so important, I really do believe that the world that we're living in demands that we equip and train not only ourselves, but let me just say this, I have a gigantic heart for the next generation. And in getting that heart for that next generation, we need to be able to dive into their lives and prepare them not for the 70s, even though the 70s was incredibly cool, and that's the era that I grew up in. I mean, who wouldn't want to grow up during the 70s? The 80s, if you grew up during more during the 80s, you know, God bless you. I hate your music. If you grew up during the, oh, it's okay. All the people that sang during that time are in jail or should be. Um, <clears throat> if you grew up in the 90s and 2000s, whatever time you grew up in, that's not it anymore. And everybody knows this. Now, let me just kind of switch this back. This time we're living in requires a robust follower of Jesus, unlike any other time I think that I've been alive. And so therefore, we're looking at the book of Romans, not, I think, from maybe the Pollyannish way in which I grew up in the 70s, which in so many ways were simple. Those of you that grew up in the 60s, um, nobody remembers that time period anyways, because everybody, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But it's just this, this place in which we now are standing where we're trying to prep people for the world we live in now. And so what we've been trying to do in this is we've been trying to connect this to what Paul's been doing in the book of Romans. We kind of created a metaphor of this idea of a song and are we listening to the correct song? In other words, are we hearing the voice of God, the, the melody, the rhythm of what God is doing in this world? Or are we kind of, again, buying into all these other melodies and rhythms that are out there and bringing them into our life instead of learning more and more and more what it means to listen to his voice and to live for him? We also then talked about it, not so much metaphorically, this idea of a story and that everybody in this, in this room, I don't care who you are and everybody in this world, lives by some kind of a story. We have an idea of where everything came from. We have an idea of how it got broken. We have an idea of how it's gonna get fixed. We have an idea of where everything is moving. Everybody lives by a story, but the problem is you live by the wrong story and your life is gonna go in a direction that God never intended in his creation. It's gonna move more and more away from who he is. And so we need to learn that true correct story and we talked about the importance of God's word now last week though we talked about this and we begin and I told you we're going to come back to Romans 1 16 and 17 is we begin to lay out this idea then is that it's not just something to be kind of understood in other words we don't just do bible studies because we're bored and we thought we'd sit there and learn some factual information we actually have to live this now, the reality of living, though, is that God does, didn't this morning wake up and say, Todd, here's what's going to go on today. Here's your script. I'd like you to follow your script. Uh, you're going to wake up at X time. You're going to try to figure out how to get to, to where you need to be, your wife without you. You know, he's not saying that. That means every single day we're always improving. We never know what's going to come our way. 
We don't know if, like this last week, man, we didn't realize that underneath our slab, the hot water was going to suddenly get a break in the, in the, in the uh, copper pipe, and suddenly our house was going to go into chaos. And so what did we need to do at that moment? We just improv. You don't know what your kids are going to do, whether they're going to go off the deep end. You don't know what your spouse is going to do. We're constantly in this state of figuring out, God, we understand your rhythm. We understand this melody of what you're doing in this world. We understand your story. Now, in light of that, how do I live? That's really the question that we're asking. And so we brought up this idea that what we need to know from Romans 1, 16 and 17, last week we laid out two ideas, is what is the gospel from the book of Romans? We really tried to understand what was Paul saying about the gospel, but I would say there's a second question that we're asking, which is what does it mean to have faith or to believe? Now this is so important to, again, how we improv, because what you believe about the gospel, this is what I argued last week, what you believe about the gospel, and again, we just looked at Romans, but there's a fuller understanding as we begin to look through the entire Bible, but from the book of Romans will dictate what it is that you believe will be good news. So if you believe a wrong gospel or a wrong good news, which we'll talk about at the very end of the service here in a little bit, I believe then you're going to go off the deep end. But not only that, from a standpoint of faith, what we believe is very important. Now, here's, here's what I just put. And again, if you need to take a picture of this, this is kind of, again, the gospel from the book of Romans, how we kind of broke that down. But the gospel is not first about getting saved. Now, again, some people are like, what are you talking about? Isn't it about me? Well, we've been trying to argue, actually, that it's not about you. This is about King Jesus. And specifically, though the story saves people, again, don't miss that. I'm not saying it's less than that. But at, at first, or at its core, the good news of Jesus being made manifest as the Messiah of Israel, the Lord of the world, through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. It's about Jesus and his kingship and his kingdom. Now, again, I want to throw this quote back up here because I think this is really helpful. We tend to think the gospel is only for unbelievers. Tim Keller put it this way, though. He said, the gospel is not the first step in a stairway of truths. Rather, it's more like the hub in a wheel of truth. The gospel is not just the ABCs, but the A to Z of Christianity. The gospel is not just the minimum required doctrine necessary to enter the kingdom, but the way we make all progress in the kingdom. We're not justified by the gospel and then sanctified by obedience, but the gospel is the way we grow. It's the way we're renewed. The solution to each problem, the key to each closed door, the power through every barrier. And so this is important. The gospel is even for those of us that are believers. And faith then is more of a posture of trust and surrender and allegiance, which is just, I would say this, the fitting and proper response to the gospel. So we just said, we've got to, before we begin to any way improv this, these are two things we have to understand. Now, where we're going to go today is we're going to kind of look at this idea, and let me just go to this next section, is that then how do we bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name amongst all the nations? This is the place we keep getting going to. How do we not only embrace this, but how do we help others to have a faith that produces an obedience? A true, authentic faith. Again, faith not like we're trying to then in any way do obedience to get faith, but a faith that produces obedience. How do we do that? Well, I think to this, it's really important is this idea of we need to understand what is the righteousness of God and, what are, and who are the righteous. Now, I'm gonna be very simplistic, just so everybody knows, and so if some of you in here are kind of, you like to, like me, you like to theologically geek out, I'm gonna give a simplistic understanding of this idea of righteousness, and then as we teach through the book, we're gonna expand it out, but today we're gonna to look at this idea of righteousness being right. It's right. Now, what we mean by that is, is then we have to understand if there's this righteousness that's being revealed across the world, the question we're asking ourselves is how are we writing the world in God's way? This is what it's going to mean to improv. We want to now join God in bringing about rightness to bear upon this particular world. Now, there's two important questions that we're going to ask that need to keep in the back of our minds. And where we're going today, this is going to be so huge to bring in this to its final conclusion. One is this, what is the righteousness of God in Romans? And the second question we're going to ask is, who are the righteous? That's where we've been going on this. So here's the first aspect of it that's important. When we say this idea of righteousness, and this is just kind of, we're going to walk through these, it's an attribute of God, which he is perfectly right in his being and his actions. He's the standard of the measurement. So let's go back to this idea of it being right. All throughout the Bible, God portrays himself as perfect, and he is. 
He is absolutely right. There's no cattywampus nature in any way to him. He is always true right on. Now, this is so important because oftentimes I've done it and I'm sure you've done it. We've shaken our fist at God, maybe not openly, but then inside of us and we thought, God, what is wrong with you? And let me just be able to say this in front of everybody. The answer to that question is nothing. He is absolutely right in his character. It is an attribute of who he is. In the back of our heads, we have to come to this understanding that there is nothing ever wrong or off in God. He is perfectly and wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, right. He's not only right in that way, but here's the other thing. He's that way in who he is and how he acts. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about, looking at a couple passages from the Old Testament. Ezra, when he's writing and kind of declaring over the people who God is, he says this to him, O Lord, the God of Israel, you are, and here's our word that we're going to look at, just. Or it's our same word, actually, that means righteous. He declares to him, you're right. It's a group of people that are coming back after being uh, held inside of, 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 of being exiled away from their nation. They're coming back into it. And the declaration of what they, wanna, uh, they, they want to tell to God in that moment, the problem is not with you, God. The problem is with us. You are absolutely right. You are whole. You are perfect in who you are. There's nothing off about you. Even the psalmist said this, gracious is the Lord, and here's our word, righteous, or again, it could be just, but we're just gonna say this, you are right, and God is merciful. Now, what that lends us to understand then is in his personhood, then God is not only just by, and I would say this, not only by nature and attribute right, even this, he's relationally right in his triunity. In other words, here's the craziest part about it. I had a guy who said this one, one time to me, he goes, was God like okay before he created humans? Like, was he all right? And the answer in his triunity in the Father and the Son and the Spirit, he was absolutely right. He's perfectly loving towards himself. He's perfectly able to see all things, know all things. Everything that the Father knows, the Son knows, and everything that the Son knows, the Spirit knows. He is absolutely right relationally. But not only is he right relationally, and this is what we have to understand about God, in his relationship with humanity, he is never wrong. So anytime you've ever thought in the back of your head, God, what's wrong with you? The answer is nothing. The problem is in me. Now you see this in Zephaniah, the way he handles it, and I'm only gonna give you part of this verse and we're gonna come back to it here in just a second. But you see this in Zephaniah when, he, when the Lord says, with the Lord within her Jerusalem, here's our word, is righteous. He's right. He does no injustice. Actually, that word is just the opposite. He puts an awe in front of it, like we look at moral or amoral. This is just him putting an awe in front of it. You don't do any injustice. You can't possibly, there's no way whatsoever that you can do anything other than right. And look at this part, every morning he shows forth his justice. That's actually the word again, our word of righteous or righteousness. He shows it forth each dawn, look at this, he does not fail. Our God is perfect. He's right in every way. He's right in his own relationship with himself. He's right in how he relates to humanity. And here's the other thing. Not only is God by attribute righteous, not only is he relationally righteous, but listen to me. Everything that God is doing in this world, when I mean, you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, he's taking a messed up world, starting in Genesis 3.15 we see this, and he is making it right. Every aspect of what he's doing is about that. He's seeking to take what is messed up and make right, which by the way, aren't you thankful? Because we're gonna look at here in just a second, we are not right. Now you might think that you're right, but let me be the first to break it to you. You're not. We are all broken and in desperate need of Jesus. And the greatest news in the world is, is our God is determined to set all things right and nothing will stop him. So that lends us to this. Let me just put these three things together. The righteousness of God, again, we're gonna look at it from a kind of a simplistic standpoint this morning and we'll, we'll expand it more later. But when we talk about God being righteous, he is by attribute righteous, 
He's by relationship righteous, he, how he deals with himself, because he always, righteousness demands relationship. And not only this, but by action, everything that he does, he is seeking to carry out and to bring about rightness within his world. All right, so everybody with me so far? You got me? Okay, don't, don't, don't bail out yet, because this has a great ending to it. Now, one of the things, though, that we know, and it's what I talked about just in a second that Zephaniah brings to the surface, is that while God is perfectly just and does no awe justice or does no awe righteousness or awe rightness, there is a group of people called the unjust who knows no shame. Now, to talk about the unjust, it's not just those people, you know, that are the other people. I'll never forget this. Right after 9-11 came out, I was, I was a newer follower of Jesus, a newer follower of, uh, as a, or a newer pastor. And I remember sitting around with what I thought were all of these just godly men. And again, I, they, they were godly and they are godly. But I remember them having this discussion after the, the planes got thrown into 9-11. One guy and all of them began to agree this. Why don't we just nuke them all back to hell? What? In their head, in their story, the United States would be better if we just nuked a group of human beings created in the image of God, and this is the exact words, back to hell? This is why Paul's actually writing the book of Romans. See, what he wants them to know is that sure, this world is messed up. In fact, in Romans 1, 18 through 32, he's like, well, no duh, this world is messed up. We're messed up from the top of our heads to the bottom of our toes. But the people of God begin to think we are not. And all of 2, 1 through 320 is this gigantic argument that every human being that has ever lived is messed up and we are in desperate need of this God who's absolutely right to come to bear on our lives. We don't have the right to look at other human beings and say, I'm great and you're not. That means even in our culture, I would say this, a group of people that I think the church has struggled with for the longest time would be those within the homosexual community. Do I think homosexuality is a sin? Yes, I do. But we have oftentimes looked at that community and that particular group of people as less than us, that somehow in them, they're not us. And I think God is looking at us saying, you're messed up just as much apart from the grace of God. Now with that though, what does that then mean? Well, this last kind of part of this idea of righteousness and who God is, God's good world and humanity, however, are not right. It's not just humanity, by the way. Everybody knows this. Our world just isn't right, is it? Like in some ways, like if you could pull yourself back for just a second to that time period in which Adam and Eve sinned, there was a shudder that went through the entire universe. Every aspect of God's good created world wasn't just kind of sad about what happened. We're going to learn from the book of Romans, all of creation shuddered at it. You even see this like in Paul's argument in Romans 5, 17. He says, look, there was this one man whose trespass brought death to reign through him. And death just isn't that we die. It is that all of humanity begin to enter into this state of decay. It began to be the opposite of the intent of God. Now, God is going to fulfill his intent, but this unique reality was it became ah, dikaios, or it became ah, right. It wasn't right anymore. And it wasn't just that, but it was every human. This is what I've been arguing. It was Jews, it was Greeks, it was the barbarians. It was all these people that have ever stood on this world, every last aspect, from the oldest to the youngest, are in in who we are. There is no one who escapes this reality. People will say to me sometimes, I, I don't think that I'm that bad or I'm not that far off or I'm in different things. No, everyone, everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one who is righteous. No, not one. Every last one. And our world in 820 through 22 is just dying to get out of it. All of creation is groaning and longing for the day of God's intent when he will finally set everything straight. And let me just say this so that everybody hears it. There is coming a day when it is currently being made right, but it will absolutely be made right. We will wake up one day realizing that all of creation is set right. King Jesus is enthroned for who he is, and we will then enter into the shalom, the peace of God. We will enter into it. That is 
all of what God is moving towards, and I promise you that's where it's going. So then what's the answer then around righteousness? Well, one of the solutions to this, that God is gonna make this world right, and you kind of see this in Romans 1.17, he, he talks about this idea that, that the righteousness of God is revealed, and look at this, from faith for faith. So in some way, God's rightness is being revealed into the world. We're gonna see this, though, in Romans 1.18. Well, what is it that's being revealed into the world? Watch this. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, and here's the opposite of the word, unrighteousness or non-rightness. It's not something that's a future reality that we're gonna experience God's wrath. In fact, the way that Paul puts it in Romans 1, 18 through 3.20, specifically 1, 18 through 32, this world is right now experiencing the wrath of God. And I would say it this way, all of us that kind of remember what it was like to be an unbeliever, we remember what it was like to be rejecting that God, going down a path far from him, and our life was becoming a mess until we understood our desperation and need of Jesus. In fact, I would say this, we are currently not living in hell, but we're living in a form of hell as people reject God and choose to live for themselves. And then as we look around, and especially if you, I don't know if you've been into the city of Los Angeles in a while, when you drive into this particular city anymore, it is odd to us, it's awe righteousness, it is not right, there's something about it that's blatant. I would even say that, we don't see it out here, but we are also not right. It's God trying to tell the world, do you see this? Humanity left to themselves, this is where we go. Over and over throughout history, I don't care what group of people it is, and I promise you, if Jesus tarries, well, I love the country that I am born in, I love the freedom that I've received, so please don't leave here and go, man, that Todd, he's not patriotic or whatever. I just know like every other country that's ever been on the face of the world, we will go the same direction as every other country. We are not exempt. We will move towards non-rightness. And I would even say we've kind of been non-right from the beginning. So what does that mean? Well, God does reveal himself through judgment or through wrath, but here's the greatest news in the world. Now just feast on this. Jesus, our Lord, was delivered up for our trespasses, this thing that has caused all this problem, this shudder throughout the entire universe, and raised for our justification, raised for our rightness. Jesus Christ didn't just defeat sin on, on the cross. That's what I hear so often. He died for our sins, which is so true. I mean, think about this. Everything that now we deserve the wrath of God, yet in the goodness of Jesus, he bore the wrath of God on our behalf. And now we're gonna learn this in a little bit, Romans 8, 1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I don't know when is the last time you woke up and thought, oh my gosh, because I'm in Christ, I'm right. I won't face that wrath. Are you kidding me? In fact, I think we've lost the joy in that. I think we've lost like the excitement of knowing that we are no longer wrath bearers because of Jesus. But don't miss this next part. Oftentimes we think of righteousness in terms of Jesus' death in a forensic or kind of legal way that he is, and it's a totally true way in which I'm declared righteous. I am, I am this one who is now declared holy, completely it righteous in front of a holy God. That is absolutely true, but we are raised also for something, for our rightness. What does that mean? Well, anytime we talk about resurrection in the New Testament, it always talks about an action that God's called us to. So let's kind of figure out then, what is the action that God's called us to? Now, the, reaction, the action is, is gonna have to do with salvation and redemption and liberation, okay? So this is everywhere that God is going. All aspects of who he is, his attributes, his relationship, his action, is gonna now create within us an attribute, a relationship, and an action, okay? That's where we're gonna go. Now watch this. For if because of one man's trespass, this is what we looked at earlier, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace, and the, look at this, free gift of righteousness, rightness, reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, you have been gifted an attribute of rightness. You can't obtain it, you can't work towards it. You can't make it happen. This rightness is actually a gift to you. 
When I come to Jesus Christ by faith, I am now seen completely and wholly because the Bible's gonna talk about in both Romans 6 and Romans 8 that I am placed in Christ and now he sees all of those in Christ as absolutely right. Holy right, W-H-O-L-L-Y. He sees us as his very own. He sees us as completely his. Like this is one of those things, again, when we talk about who we are in Christ, we are right. For all of those that sit somehow think in the back of their head that if I've had a bad day, somehow God looks at me differently than if I've had a good day, you are wrong. God always looks at those that are in Christ as absolutely right. Now again, that's crazy. Because that's not how I am as a parent. We, we joked while we were on vacation, we had a ranking system. Uh, we have four children, right? We always, we'd rank them every day. It was a joke. But every day we'd rank them and be like, okay, you know, Josiah, you're number one. Brianna, you fell to number four. I'm sorry about this. And we were joking about it. Now, again, the joke just has to do with, just I think within us, is that we understand that God, though, doesn't see us as his kids like that. He sees us as totally Right? And God's gift of rightness to those unworthy of it through forgiving sins by means of Christ's work and establishing them in rightness. Totally and completely and 100% accepted. There is nothing more that I need to do to obtain the acceptance of the Father. I am completely and wholly accepted in him. That does not mean there's not expectations of how we're called to live, but this is something we have to get into our minds. If I'm a follower of Jesus, I am wholly his, all of me. Romans 5, 18 through 19, therefore as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, look at this, one act of rightness, righteousness, leads to rightness, this justification in life for all men, for as by the one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made now right. It's a position, it's a position and an attribute that's given to us. We're just like now included into this reality because of Jesus. That's how I need to look at my wife. Man, the other day I was sitting there and we were kind of interacting. I was so frustrated with my wife and this kind of idea came in the back of my head. Be very careful, Todd. That woman right there is someone who is right in God's sight. Don't mess with God's little girl. That's wild. Like at first I was gonna tell her what, not, how it all fits together. And all of a sudden, you know those moments where you're just like, I'm out. That's daddy's little girl. But Isaiah 29, 13, it's not just he wants to see this now as an attribute we have. Because I think sometimes when we think of righteousness, we think it's like just a position that we sit in. It's a legal justification where the one-time act of God where he declares the sinner righteous while he still remains in a sinning state, which is true. But God wants us to see it again bigger. In Isaiah 29, you kind of see this, is that, hey, here's my people. They draw near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips. But look at this. Their hearts are what? Far from me. God did not rescue you to leave you out far from him. He did not. God is not going to allow you to stay out there. In fact, I would say this, those people that do not have a desire for nearness to God may not even know what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Like I said, it is an absolute free gift to receive this rightness, this righteousness, but there's expectations that God says we are going to relationally be together. God created this world to have a relationship with humanity, not just to spin it into existence and let it go. He demands relationship. We will be in a right relationship together. And it will be not just something that you say with your lips or mouth with your words, but it is gonna be this place. And this is what the whole promise of the Old Testament of the New Covenant was. I'm gonna get after your heart. I'm gonna get after that core aspect of you so you don't just love me by your mouth or love me by your words, but you love me deep within who you are relationally that we know one another. I know you and you know me. Perfectly? No, not yet. But we're knowing him. Don't settle. Remember I said this last week. Don't settle for anything less. 
I feel like we're so satisfied that we're not going to hell and God is offering us so much more than an avoidance of hell. He's offering us relationship with him, knowing him. We're granted that opportunity and Paul is gonna teach us in the book of Romans, our father won't settle for anything less. That's why there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, not for your hell avoidance, but to draw people to himself. In your non-rightness, nobody can stand before God. Nobody. He sits in unapproachable light. Nobody. But he has made us right, not just because for making us right's sake. He has made us right, and here's now this relational piece. It's not only a positional attribute that he's given to us, but now it becomes this relational part where we can know the God of the universe. You even see this like in Romans 8, 15 through 17, where you start to see the fatherhood of God, which by the way, should blow all of our minds to pieces. He says in there, you've not received a spirit of slavery. You're not a slave to fall back into fear. You're not just a household slave within who we are. You've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, what? Daddy, Abba, Father, no way and it is more real than the physical fathers we have but listen to me if you've ever had a bad father which by the way no dad is great well except for your dad but when our dads our dad our father abba father is completely right he loves us completely right He adores us completely right on good days and on bad days. He's our father. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, and then he adds this part that we'll talk about later, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be also glorified with him. We're not just anybody. Like I I want so badly for us just as people, me, you, to get, we are kids of the king. That is crazy to me. I've been trying to wrap my mind around it. You know, maybe it'd be like being, you know, Barack Obama's son or Donald Trump's son. I thought, no, not that. What's it like? We're kids of the king. But we're now, as kids of the king, called to action. Christ's rightness now makes people relationally right for something to happen now. For the spirit of God, you're gonna see this in Romans 8. That's why I brought it out there. For the spirit of God's presence to be in and amongst his people. See, if Christ is in you, Paul argues, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness, rightness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells, and here's the key, in y'all, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead also will give life to y'all's mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in y'all. Meaning, Daddy, our Father, has a unique family that we've been all called into, and He's calling us now to live in a certain way through the empowerment of His Spirit. Now, God isn't just looking at me as an attribute of what He has given me, a positional attribute. It's not now just a relationship, but He's now going to give us the power that we need to pull this off. The power that we need to learn how to be good husbands or wives or or parents or kids or friends or friendships, a worker or a boss. He's gonna give us these things and now we're getting into the idea of improv. He is going to give us what we need and here's the key to bring about rightness in the world in which we live. So he's not just now seeing us as right. He's not now just including us in and making us right, but he's making us right for a reason and a purpose. And I would say this, we always have, I've always heard the gospel, you know, just believe it and who cares what you do. That is baloney. Believe it now. And here's the thing I would say, join him. Join him. Join him not on your mission, but on his mission. Well, how? How? You have the living God via the person of the Holy Spirit in and amongst us, the one who raised Jesus from the dead. How? God is in us. Now all of a sudden we don't realize that submission, thank you by the way, whoever said that, God bless you. I'm glad to know somebody loves Jesus. No, I'm I'm totally kidding, I'm totally kidding. But submission to the Holy Spirit, look at this, makes us slaves to actually rightness. We no longer have to live for ourselves. 
We get to now live for him in this powerful, dynamic way. We get to learn in this life because he doesn't hand out scripts every day how it is that I live. And look at this, and the outcome is life and Christ-likeness. To live for him, he says in there, is not only granted to you life, but to live for him is life. That means if I forsake the story that I used to live by and embrace the story that he's called me to, I will find life, and Jesus says not only life, but life unimaginable. Why would I forsake my old story? Not just because it's a wrong story, not just because it's the means of me avoiding hell, because Jesus' story in Romans 6 is the story of life. It's the story of his intent in which he's moving everything. Everything about what he's doing is that. That's why Paul says, thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient. There's our word that we've been looking at from the very beginning. How do we become obedient? We become obedient from the hearts to the standard of teaching to which you are committed and having been, look at this, set free from sin and have become slaves of what? Rightness. Paul is showing them. It's an attribute that he gives us. It's now a relationship that we share, but now it's a lifestyle that we come about. And then he says in this, and it leads to sanctification, and its end is what? Eternal life. Don't settle for anything less. I know every day we think we want to settle. I know those moments that, again, I'm a parent, so I get it, With especially little ones. I don't get the ones that are actually, you know, have huge ramifications on their life yet. But I get those moments where it's like, how dare this little kid ruin my day? The audacity after I hand out scripts in the morning and he or she is choosing to live in a way contrary to what I've been called to, missing the fact that God is not calling me to hand out scripts. He's calling me to, in his power, bring about what he determines is rightness. These precious little ones that have been granted to us or these precious old ones that we walk with. It's about rightness. I remember when my dad one time came to me and, and, and again, don't be offended by this where I come from in Wyoming, we spank. But my dad had just spanked me. And I, I remember in that moment thinking, oh, the big jerk. Like, I mean, I was so angry. And then my dad always said after he spanked me, come here so that I can hug you. Right? And I didn't realize it, but there was kind of a mirror set up with a mirror and a mirror in this room, which that's weird. But a mirror is kind of set up and I'm looking and all of a sudden I'm seeing tears go down my dad's face. And all of a sudden he grabbed my cheeks and he just started talking to me. This, I love you. I do this because I love you. My dad was concerned about rightness. He wasn't concerned about being embarrassed that his son embarrassed him. Maybe he was. I don't know. I don't know what was going on in his head. But I think so often we miss the fact it's about rightness. He was joining God in bringing rightness to bear on my life. This is what he's calling us to, is this idea of rightness. For those whom he foreknew, look at this, he's also predestined, look at this, to be conformed to the image of his son, to, to rightness. That means now when sickness comes along, it's for the purpose of rightness, to bring me about, to cause me to look more like Jesus. When I'm in a difficult or even a good marriage, God is allowing these things to happen, not because he's an evil God, but he's seeking to bring about rightness in my life. When I'm in a job that has a stinky boss or I've got bad employees, he's not this evil, awful, terrible God. He's using everything to bring about rightness in your life. No problem is out there that God doesn't intend in his giant scheme of things from beginning to end in all of our lives to bring about about rightness in us. And I would say this, Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you is not going to quit until he has got it together. That's his goal. So let's put it this way. Let's kind of look at it. The righteousness of God has an attribute to it, relational, it's action. But now when we talk about this idea of the righteous who we are, it's a positional attribute that God grants to us, gifts to us of rightness, it's in relationship. It demands relationship between God and us and us and others. But here's the thing. It demands an action. Here's the question that I've been asking myself all week long in everything. 
am I joining God in bringing about right? Now for Paul, what he's going to do is he's going to talk about this idea of God's unleashing people to manifest the right in and amongst themselves, in other words, amongst the Roman people at that time, uh, or the Roman Christians, also it's Roman world, but their world, and here's the thing, like Jesus Christ would. Now, I don't know how many of you remember the What Would Jesus Do bracelets? Do you remember that? During the 90s? See, that's why the 90s was awful too. Now, in some ways, they almost had it, but we shouldn't be asking the question, what would Jesus do? We have been empowered to do what Jesus would do. We have a story. We have a song that has a rhythm to it and a melody to it. Every single day, those people in submission to the Holy Spirit can actually live and operate like Jesus did. You're not Jesus, don't get me wrong, but you can. That means tomorrow morning we can wake up and we can operate like Jesus did. We can improv like Jesus did. We can actually improv like Jesus would drive on the freeway. What would that look like? We can improv with our children and our spouses and our friendships. We can improv like God has called us to now because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us and we're unleashed to now improv like Jesus would at work, in our play, in our recreation, in every aspect of life. In other words now, the Holy Spirit is always gonna honor Jesus Christ. So therefore, when we are in submission to the Holy Spirit, empowered by him, every action of what will come out of our life, again, not perfection, we're gonna make mistakes all the time. That's why we need the gospel. But that's what we're improving is Christ. In every facet of life. It should look like Christ and sound like Christ. It should interact with people like Christ. Now for the Romans in Romans 12 through 16, Paul's gonna lay out what that looks like and we'll talk about it when we get there. But I was wrestling through what does that look like in Simi Valley. Now, this is what's so strange. Earlier today, as we came into the service, probably about like six or seven people said, oh, I can't wait to move from Southern California. And I'm thinking, oh, great. My end point is always about moving to Southern California. So if you're one of these people in here that talked to me about moving from Southern California, I'm saying this, it was already in my notes and I can prove it to you. So you don't come up to me later and think, oh, you're talking to me. But let me just say this. There's a story that I think many of us believed when we came to see me or even when somebody came to the United States, which we came here for the good life. We came because it was the safest city. We came because, and I'm gonna put this in quotes, somewhat affordable. We came because it was family friendly. We came because we sat in the shadow of the Ronald Reagan Library. <laughs> and now what I'm starting to hear oftentimes is, it doesn't feel as safe. It's not as affordable. It's not as family friendly. It's not as politically conservative. There's a high cost of living. My kids are leaving. It just doesn't feel right to let me say this. No, duh. It shouldn't feel right. This world is not right. And all of you that think somehow that you can move to Wyoming or Montana or Idaho, and again, I, I don't say this in a mocking way at all. You're gonna get there and guess what you're gonna find? It's not right. You'll just have maybe a better cost of living, a nicer place to live, but it still won't be right. Now, if God's called you to go, man, God bless you. Go back there and good luck when you go back there. And I don't mean it weird either. I just mean it, man, it's a tough place to live too. But our story is not about safety. Our story is not about a better cost of living. Our story is not about affordability. Our story is not a political conservativeness. Our story is about King Jesus who came and enveloped himself in flesh at great cost to himself to rescue humanity, to make them his very own, and then to unleash them in this world to bring about rightness. That's our story. And don't settle for anything less. Don't. Don't. Teach your kids about this amazing story. 
don't teach them that somehow it's just what would Jesus do or somehow that Jesus wants you to be poor or he wants you to be rich or he wants you to be radical or he wants you to be non-radical. Teach them the story. And then come in and live it with them. Sit down with them and talk about it. Talk with those that you're discipling. This is what we're doing because be careful. If you start to do certain things that portray a different story, your kids just might embrace that wrong story. And if they embrace that wrong story, they're gonna join hundreds of other people, excuse me, hundreds of millions of other people that believe somehow that their story is written by themselves. This story is not about us. It is about King Jesus. And so therefore, Cornerstone, in the power of the Holy Spirit, don't settle for anything. Don't settle for any other story. Understand in this story, you're gonna fail. That's why we need the gospel. Man, this week, if you're like me, you failed so much, and especially now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, oh great, I failed there, and I failed there, and I failed there. I, th- I mean, I'm serious, I'm standing in front of you going, why am I preaching? I'm a huge failure, but welcome to the club, I guess. We fail. But the gospel then writes us. It cleanses us, it brings us back into what God's called us to be. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, go live for the King this week. Live in the power of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you a promise. All of us who live for the King this week, even in the midst of our failures and our difficulties, this purpose and intention of God, what he's doing in this world, which he promises to right all things, when you stand before him one day, you will not regret living for him. You will not regret in the least living for him. And so in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, God bless you this week to live in rightness from a God who is right and to go bring about rightness in the power of the Holy Spirit like Jesus would call us to. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.